Good morning. Ohayko uh, Zaimas. Mizu uh, Ayimaska. And that's the end of all of my Japanese. So, uh, uh, anyway, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, usually I deliver this presentation uh, by a teleconference, uh, but it's nice to be here in Japan. Uh, and uh, so I think this will be more fun than when I'm doing it just at home in my room alone. Um, uh, you guys, uh, if you've been to one of these jamborees, you've seen this presentation before. It's really just a real quick smattering of uh, information about uh, what's going on with Embedded Linux. Um, just a quick overview. I don't go into anything in uh, a lot of depth. Uh, but hopefully, if you see something interesting uh, in my slides, I've got lots of links, and the PDF is is online. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, during the introductions, I was reading LWN.net, and I saw something new, so I added a slide between the start of the presentation, <laughs> between the start of the jamboree, and now. So uh, if you downloaded this beforehand, go get a new copy. <laughs> uh, it's literally some of this news is is less than uh, 15 minutes old. Uh, so, um, but uh, so this is the major areas that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about kernel versions, uh, and then go into technology areas. There's some overlap between this because I talk about kind of on a per version basis, and then I talk about the. Um, uh, within each technology area. Then I'll go over some CE workgroup projects and uh, then talk about some other stuff, miscellaneous things. So kernel versions. In the last year, we've had a very, very regular cadence of kernel releases, uh, either 70 days or 63 days. We just had the merge window for 4.15, which means we have a good idea of the things that are going to be in 4.15. Uh, I predict because of Christmas uh, that this will be a 70-day release cycle. I was going to go back and check to see if ones over Christmas lasted a week longer. Anyway, I'm predicting January 21st. I don't even know why I make these predictions anymore because it's so consistent that uh, it doesn't show much much uh, skill to make a prediction like this. Um, so I'll go over the releases fairly quickly uh, because I'm going to talk about most of these topics under the technology areas. Uh, but in 4.9, uh, we have virtually mapped kernel stacks. Uh, that is kind of a big deal. It's on x86 only right now. Uh, but it, uh, it is a change in the way the stacks are used in the kernel uh, so that it means that you can catch memory faults if there's a stack overrun. That has not been the case before. Uh, there's always the kernel's always been susceptible to stack overruns that just walked off into process address space or into kernel address space, uh, and so this actually cleans up the kernel code. And the amazing thing is that it made uh, process creation faster. So not only is it safer, but it's actually faster. Um, and uh, even though it's only on x86 now, I think uh, we'll see. Hopefully, we'll see the same type of support on other platforms. Well, I don't know. I don't, know, I don't know exactly the details what they did, but hopefully they'll, um, they'll get at this on like ARM. Uh, Graybus was added to the kernel. Uh, there are timed samples for eBPF. Uh, and then mod versions was deprecated. I don't know if very many people are using mod versions in, in embedded, but it's going away. Um, and then in 4.10, uh, this is a little, over a, year, a little under a year ago, uh, perf continues to kind of grow in features. There's something called perf sketch time hist, which gives you histograms of the information. Uh, there's a new uh, feature having to do with block stuff, which is hybrid block polling. So usually the fastest way that you can do uh, block I.O. is by polling the device. Um, but you end up wasting a lot of time in your polling loop. Uh, you could be doing something else. So this is a new system that uh, what it does is it the the block scheduler predicts when the when the I/O is going to complete, and it will go away for a little while and try to come back and schedule the wake up uh, right before the the stuff completes. So you get the full benefit of polling. You're you're sitting in your polling loop right as the uh, data comes back or as the block I/O completes, but you've been, actually been able to go off and do something else. So it's actually a nice performance. Uh, there's no degradation. It's this, the same performance as polling, 
but with the addition that it's not a CPU hog. So that's pretty cool. Um, support for ARM SOCs, there's been a lot more work. Uh, it was put into 410 for Huawei, Allwinner, Marvell, and Rinsos chips. Uh, POSIX timers are configurable, and I'll talk more about that um, and when I get to the size stuff later on. Uh, the init RAMFS compression method is selectable. So it used to be there was only one compression method available. Now you can choose. Uh, there's a new interface for system sleep, uh, state selection, and uh, UBIFS has, now has support for encryption. Uh, again, I'm kind of going through these kind of fast. Uh, if you're interested in these, you can follow some of these links. Uh, in 4.11, there's a new kernel ref count API. Uh, the tiny DRM subsystem was added. Uh, there's a new system call, StatX, which resolves uh, some of the issues that the old stat had with uh, the time values uh, only being 32-bit. Uh, uh, so this one has, uh, I think, they may have gone overboard and gone to like 128 bits. <laughs> uh, but uh, they're, they're 230, year 2038 safe values. And, and also it's more efficient because you can now specify a mask of what fields you want the stat to return. So you don't have to ask. The old stat, you asked and you got all of the information that it returned. This one, you can be selective and you can say, I only want these pieces of information. Some of the pieces of information take longer to calculate than others. So this will this is more efficient. Uh, you can only request the things that you need the kernel to figure out for you. Uh, and then a big thing in this one is uh, sketch.h refactoring. If you've got code that depends on uh, kind of the layout of sketch.h, uh, then you need to watch out uh, because the, the fields have changed around some. There is refactoring of that. Uh, and uh, if your code's out of mainline, this will be a little bit painful. The kernel developers don't care. <laughs> so they're, they're willing to cause you a little bit of pain, but this is a... Uh, I'm not sure why they did this, but uh, I'm sure they have some good reasons. In uh, 4.12, uh, there are some new block I.O. schedulers, BFQ and Kyber. And to be honest with you, I don't remember what the uh, what advantages these different had ones. I assume the F in BFQ stands for fair, uh, but uh, it's hard to know. Um, but that's something you might want to look at if you're interested in file system performance. Uh, there's the mini TTY prep work. So, uh, and I'll talk about that more later. We do not have the full implementation of mini TTY. Uh, but some of the underlying foundational work has been put in for that. I'll talk again more about that later. Uh, there's proper support for USB Type-C connectors. There's a new tool in the kernel for analyzing boot time. Uh, it reads the D message and uh, can also provide an F trace log and produces a nice HTML graph of boot events. And so Intel has been doing uh, a whole, they have a whole collection of tools to do this type of thing where they look at logs and produce charts and graphs and things. Um, and uh, you can, this, this is the location inside the, uh, uh, under tool, power, PM graph, analyze boot. I don't know if there are other tools in there, but uh, lots of interesting stuff going on uh, with instrumentation. Uh, in 4.13, we're getting pretty close to, uh, this came out in the summer. Uh, we have a new uh, TLS implementation, that's an, an encryption, uh, network encryption uh, layer that's uh, inside the kernel, so that should help with HTTPS performance. Um, and then uh, there's also next interrupt prediction. So there's some uh, work in the scheduler to predict what the next interrupt will be that fires and to prepare for that. Um, and uh, also F2FS has support for disk quotas. Uh, KSELF test is transitioning to the TAP13 protocol. Again, I, I'll talk more about that later. 414 has a new kernel stack unwinder, and this is kind of a big deal. Uh, well, it is to me because I worked on the ARM stack unwinder, and boy, what a mess that was. Uh, but uh, they have a new one for x86-64. It does not rely on any uh, symbols from the compiler. It turns out it's an in-kernel data structure that they're maintaining. Uh, it's, uh, it's not just better at unwinding. Okay. It's not just better at unwinding kernel uh, the stack, it's uh, supposed to be like perfect at unwinding the kernel stack, which is actually a requirement when you're doing uh, things like uh, live patching. Uh, you have to kind of know exactly where you are on the stack, how you got there. Um, and so this is, uh, there's a lot of excitement about this. Well, 
you're, if you're kind of into this type of stuff, there's excitement about it. Um, and then there's a new compression algorithm for ButterFS and SquashFS, uh, Z standard, or I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, I, ZSTD. Um, and then uh, in terms of power management, there's been some work on CPU-free coordination with SMP. Uh, and I'll talk uh, again about both of those. And then the merge window. Uh, again, if you go out to kernel newbies or you go to lwn.net, you can see a long list of features. Most of them have to do with you know esoteric enterprise level features. But there's a couple of things that kind of apply to embedded. Uh, CramFS supports persistent memory mapping. This is actually a big deal. Uh, it doesn't sound like it. CramFS is kind of considered a crummy old uh, temp file system thing, but you can uh, you can tell CramFS not to compress it, which goes against its name, because <laughs> the C in CramFS stands for compressed. Uh, but if you tell it not to compress it, uh, you can actually map it onto existing physical blocks that are in the memory map. So if you have uh, NOR flash, uh, you can now do XIP directly out of, out of that using CramFS. So that's a pretty big deal. Uh, there, I think that's been wanted for quite a long time, and I was actually surprised that, uh, that it showed up. Um, AMD has submitted a huge driver for a lot of their display stuff. Uh, so some GPU code has gone into, uh, into the kernel for AMD, uh, which is a good precedent. We'd like to see more of that type of stuff happen. And then the device tree compiler has support for overlays. And uh, I don't know. Ask Frank if you have any questions about that. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I, I went over that stuff quickly. I'll go into uh, each of those. A lot of those will show up in these technology areas. Um, so in boot up time, so the analyzed boot time tool that I talked about it was new in 4.12. Uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of work in this area. I think we're kind of at a steady state of boot time. Basically, if you work on it hard, you can get the boot time down to a reasonable level, one to two seconds for the kernel. Um, if you really, really work on it hard, you can get it underneath that. Uh, there's a lot of talks that talk about different techniques, but uh, a lot of these end up not being mainlineable because they're, uh, you have to kind of specialize different, some of the code paths, you know, pull stuff out that it, most normal people don't. Uh, but it is possible to get decent uh, boot time on a standard embedded Linux system. Um, not on Android. <laughs> Android has its own set of issues, uh, but there, even there, there are some ideas for how to improve it. Uh, when I, w I worked on Android boot time for a while at Sony, and the best we could ever do was like 30 seconds. It's pretty terrible. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there are people who uh, pay attention to stuff. Uh, Bernard uh, works for Linea Linaro, I believe, and, uh, uh, but also Google has been looking at uh, some of the boot time issues. Uh, in terms of device tree, uh, some of the stuff, uh, there's been an ongoing discussion for quite a while now on doing some device tree validation. Uh, so coming up with a schema for the binding language and uh, then doing a validator uh, that would validate the bindings and, and the device, actual device tree data. Uh, there was a new proposal uh, for device tree validation by Pat Tellis and Grant Likely at the latest Kernel Summit. Uh, meeting. I was going to say plumber, but there was a, a discussion on this at the Kernel Summit, and um, there's also been interest over the last year, there's been expressed interest to build, write up a new device tree specification. We're way past what is contained in the old specification that was originally uh, written for PowerPC, uh, so we want to update that material, include a lot of the new mechanisms that are in device tree. And also, uh, it's weird because the original PowerPC document is under kind of a weird distribution license. Uh, you can't just copy it freely. Uh, and so it'd be nice to just have an open document that we could use. Um, and then overlays, uh, I said in the 4.15 release, the device tree compiler has support for overlays. Although Frank swears that he's going to change some stuff <laughs> to mess that up. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, in terms of file systems, just a couple of things. We have this ZSTD compression uh, that right now is available for ButterFS and SquashFS. So this just barely went in, uh, but the basic idea is that it's got uh, faster, it's both faster and gives you better compression ratios. Uh, it's faster both at compression and decompression. Uh, 
Uh, and there's, uh, I think this link uh, to the data compression options comparing behavior, I think that is uh, Arjun Vandeven did some benchmarking of it. Um, and then there's how to use it if you're using ButterFS. Of course, not a lot of people are using ButterFS and embedded, but uh, a lot of people are using SquashFS, so that's something to look at. Um, and then F2FS is support for disk quotas. And that may seem like an odd feature to add to a Flash file system. So F2FS is a Flash-friendly file system by Samsung. Uh, but apparently, uh, Google is going to start using this to do some quota stuff uh, in Android devices. Uh, and then UBIFS support uh, for encryption. And there was actually a pretty good talk about UBIFS security features uh, at uh, ELC. So in terms of graphics, uh, there's this uh, tiny DRM. Uh, so there's been a problem as the kernel has moved over to DRM, uh, they got away from the old frame buffer, which was actually a fairly simple interface for interacting with graphics. Uh, but a lot of displays used in embedded are these fairly small displays, 160s or 320s or something. Uh, and they're just over I2C or SPI. And so uh, this tiny DRM is kind of a subset of the DRM functionality uh, that users can use to uh, work on uh, those types of uh, kind of small uh, graphic displays. Uh, and then there was a presentation at ELC on Vulkan, kind of the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, kind of high-end, faster graphics, but still embedded. Um, in terms of GPU drivers, I've gone over this type of material before. There's a whole bunch of this. There's a whole bunch of GPUs out in the market. Various. Uh, they have different levels of support in mainline. Most of them are not very good about their mainline status. Uh, in particular, um, so the companies aren't doing these, but Nvidia, Vivanti, and Broadcom GPUs do have open source drivers. There are open source projects. The Nouveau. Uh, uh, driver, Etnaviv driver in the Video Core 4. In fact, at ELC Europe, there was a pretty good uh, demo of the Etnaviv stuff. Um, and there's pretty good support, there's a pretty good so open source project for Qualcomm and Reno. Uh, the Imagination, uh, they kind of teased that they might be doing an open source driver, but then uh, nothing appeared. And then our Molly was stalled. The, only, the recent news here is that actually there's some people who have picked up some, Molly, some of the Molly work. And if you look at these, they're not super recent, but like this, uh, one of these had uh, patches as recently as a couple months ago. So there appears to be people working on supporting Lima. Um, and we won't talk about ARM. <laughs> they don't seem to <laughs> appreciate that work um, as much as they should. Um, the only thing I have in networking, uh, the, the networking stack tends to have a lot of uh, enterprise and, and high-end stuff, but there is this time-sensitive networking stuff that's uh, now in the Linux kernel. Um, so for real-time systems and for video streaming, uh, where you have some real-time constraints or some, some time-sensitive constraints, uh, there, are, there are features in the kernel that allow you to specify uh, parameters for, for doing um, better, uh, more deterministic networking packets. Uh, so there's something called the SOTX time option that allows you to specify high resolution transmit start time. And there's a lot of, there was a really good talk. If you're interested at all in this stuff, I would recommend highly looking at this talk by uh, Henrik uh, that he gave at ELC Europe. Um, so uh, this, is a, this is a difficult problem uh, because obviously as soon as the packet leaves your device, there's a bunch of stuff in between you and the endpoint that might, might cause problems. So it's really kind of has to be an end-to-end -end solution. Um, right now, the hardware support for this in Linux is pretty limited, uh, but it, uh, at least there's some stuff that you can play around with there. Uh, in terms of uh, power management, the two recent things are power efficient work queues. Um, and uh, this is just more efficient work queues. The basic idea is to try and get the work queues waking up on the on the CPUs that are uh, either already running or have the right frequ uh, CPU frequency. Um, and so this is scheduler tweaks for that. Uh, the other thing uh, that is uh, the second one, better CPU free coordination. Um, so this is interesting. It allows uh, right now in the Linux kernel, or before this patch in the Linux kernel, uh, in order to adjust your CPU frequency, you have to be, you can only adjust it for your local CPU. So if you have a multi-CPU system, 
you can't go tweaking the CPU frequency of some other CPU. Uh, but this changes that so that under certain conditions, a non-local CPU can adjust the frequency. And what this is really handy for is if you have uh, a task that is waking up another task and it's going to run on another system, uh, you can actually boost the frequency uh, bef well at the same time as you schedule that other task. Um, and this is really good because right now in the system, particularly in Android, uh, they have this problem where a task gets scheduled and then it has to wait for the frequency governor to kind of detect idle and boost it. Uh, and this allows you to kind of more directly, as soon as you schedule it, get that boost going. Um, and you can read all about it on LWN.net. Um, so real time. We had the real time summit recently. It was actually also in Prague. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to go into all of the details of what they talked about, but uh, there's, these were some of the talks that were there. Uh, lessons learned, uh, working with the RT preamp patch set, uh, using COSNL to detect and fix, fix nested execution context violations, which I'm sure that means something to a real-time person. <laughs> um, a sketch deadline and the future of tracing. So you can read all about that on, on LWN.net. Uh, but basically, uh, this work continues. At that summit, uh, Thomas Gleixner also gave a status and a roadmap for the preempt RT patch, which is the, the uh, main inline or in mainline uh, system for doing this. So two things that they've done recently: uh, they got a lot of work done on hot plug locking, uh, and they did the whole timer wheel rework uh, to to make uh, the timers less latency. Um, so those, those were pretty big issues. The next thing on their list, uh, it's a very big outstanding issue, is to look at the de-entry cache, the uh, directory entry cache uh, locking, and see if they can uh, resolve some issues there. So basically, it's, it's a really difficult problem getting all of the code paths in the kernel to be friendly to, to real time. Um, and especially these locking issues where a process can hold a resource for an unbounded time are pretty difficult to, to, to cure. Uh, but they're working on it, and so we appreciate their effort. Uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, presentations on real time, uh, not just at the real time summit, but at uh, ELC Europe and at ELC. So you can go look at those uh, if you want to get some more information on this. Uh, in terms of security, this slide is, is actually, there was no updates on this one from the last session, but the, there's a big project called the Kernel Hardening Project. Uh, there's a developer called Keys Cook who is uh, doing a whole bunch of work trying to close whole categories of vulnerabilities. Uh, and lately, they've been doing a lot of stuff using GCC plugins uh, to do things like, uh, well, this kernel exec, prevent the kernel from executing user space code, uh, to zero out kernel structures passed to user space so that you don't leak information up to user space. Um, <coughs> and also this RAND struct, uh, which is randomizing the C uh, structure layouts. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that makes debugging super, super hard, <laughs> but it makes uh, the kernel uh, less likely, less vulnerable to attacks. And then there's uh, a few security presentations at ELC and ELC Europe uh, on different aspects using the TPM and uh, UBIFS. Okay, so system size, uh, which is often a, a problem in embedded, well, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but um, so the init RAMFS compression method is selectable, so you can now measure that for your own stuff. The main person who's been working on this is a guy by the name of Nicholas Petrie, um, or is it Peter? You, I, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, but uh, anyway. Um, but he's done configurable POSIX timers, he got that in. So if you are not using POSIX timers uh, in your device, you can configure that off. But basically, he's been going into a lot of the systems, finding some big subsystem that's always on, and either making it configurable or coming up with a different version that's smaller. And so that's what he's done with the TTY system. TTY system is a huge, big mess. And uh, this guy is so brave to go in there and try to refactor it and make it smaller. Uh, but uh, that's what he's been doing. He does all this work and it saves 38K. Bless his heart, he's the greatest guy. <laughs> um, and he ran into problems trying to get that mainline. There's always kind of resistance to some of these patches. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, some people wanted him to just use the full-size TTY. And, and instead of just coming up with a whole new implementation, uh, 
kind of make the current one modular and be able to slice pieces off. But Nicholas said that really wasn't a feasible approach. You really have to kind of write a new one from the ground up that's smaller. That gets rid of all those old features. Uh, he also worked on the scheduler. And this one really faced some battles upstream. Uh, so he dropped a bunch of features, eliminated some, some real time and some uh, deadline scheduler classes. Uh, save about 20k. There's a huge amount of resistance to this by the scheduler maintainers. Uh, they, uh, their claim is that the code complexity increase is not worth the size savings. And uh, if you're working on a system with a couple of terabytes of RAM, I can see why 20k would not be that impressive. But uh, anyway, there's uh, this started this thread started a whole discussion on the on the mailing list about whether uh, Linux should actually support these super super small systems. I think it should. Uh, I think you should not give up. Uh, but uh, but uh, they don't want to incur much of a maintenance uh, burden to do so. So um, and then there's uh, been a lot of uh, size presentations recently. Actually, a really good one is uh, Michael Oppenacker had a boff at ELC Europe. Uh, he had a great overview, a really exhaustive list of reduction techniques. Uh, again, this is one of those areas where you have to kind of go in and do stuff yourself. Um, but uh, one of the things is, is worth if you're interested in size, it's worth looking at Toybox and uh, Musil, uh, which is a smaller C library. Uh, so those are those are both save you quite a bit of memory. Uh, and then Nicholas Petrie gave a good session at, uh, describing some of the work he's been doing at Lenaro Connect uh, in uh, San Francisco. And then Marcel Holtman actually got uh, showed an IoT sensor project based on an Intel thing uh, running. Uh, in one meg of RAM. So it can be done. Uh, it, I don't think it was doing very much <laughs> in that one meg. Probably the whole meg was the kernel. But uh, you, can, you can get this down into uh, sizes, pretty small sizes for IoT. Okay, so now I'm going to apologize in advance because since my, my project re recently has been a testing framework, so I have a whole bunch of stuff about testing out of proportion to its importance in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to go through all these. Uh, so k-self-test, unit test framework inside the kernel source tree. Some of the recent work is there's now a dash silent option uh, that produces less output clutter. Uh, you can build the stuff in a different directory uh, using an o equal option. Uh, I don't know if it supports k-build output, which is an environment variable does the same thing. But um, there's lots more regression tests. Uh, now in k self tests than there were a year ago, and they have uh, started converting everything to uh, TAP protocol, which is a very simple uh, test output protocol. Um, and so that's actually good. It means a lot of frameworks will be able to deal with the output from it and, and uh, use it. Uh, so that's actually coming along pretty well. Um, Fuego, uh, I have a whole presentation on Fuego uh, later today, so I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, Kernel CI uh, is a really good, uh, it's got a lot of momentum, it's a build and boot test uh, farm thing. Uh, I think some of the data on this slide might actually, I think they're actually more than this, but it builds 126 different kernel trees continuously, reports any errors, and it has caught a lot of bugs, um, and there have been presentations on it. Uh, I call it the most successful public distributed build and test system for Linux in the world. Uh, there are other good test systems out there, but they're either not public or they're not distributed. Um, and, and so this is, this is a good uh, example of uh, open source uh, coming in and uh, solving a problem. Um, and then Lenaro has their own uh, test framework called Lava. Uh, it's not, it's, it is a test framework. It doesn't, it doesn't actually have a whole bunch of tests. So you, you, tests are left as an exercise for the user. Uh, but uh, they just, well, within the last year, they announced the V2 uh, version. They changed some stuff. They were using YAML for some things. They've changed over to Jinja. Um, oh, no, it was JSON before, sorry. Previously handwritten JSON. Uh, they're using a diff zero MQ for communications. Uh, they have job notifications using something called Reactobus. Uh, requires a little bit more explicit board configuration. This stuff probably doesn't mean much unless you're using Lava, but it is continues to progress. I also, uh, I didn't put on this slide, but I've heard that uh, Google is actually paying Lenaro to do some work on LTP, uh, which is pretty good. Um, LTP is the Linux test project. 
And uh, I'm sure that if Lunaro is doing it, it's going to be in a format that's consist, uh, compatible with Lava stuff. Uh, then last thing on uh, other efforts in terms of testing. Uh, this is not actually testing, but uh, kind of more bug reporting, but there's a, a guy doing uh, kernel regression tracking. Uh, his name is Thorsten Lemius, uh, and he reported at the kernel summit about some of the problems that he encountered. Uh, the kernel, there's no consistent uh, bug reporting mechanism for the Linux kernel. Uh, each maintainer kind of takes stuff on their list. There, there's no like one place you can go to to submit an error. Uh, there's really not enough people doing this type of work, so there's no community of people who will triage bugs. Um, and a lot of the errors that are on specific hardware are very hard to reproduce. Uh, so it's really hard. In a lot of, and there's also this version gap thing where the errors are being reported on kernels that the mainline uh, are done working on. Uh, anyway, so he had some really good, uh, well, at least a, a description of the problems. And there was actually a whole session on fuzzing and testing at uh, Plumbers, uh, which is also this fall. Um, and so there are a lot of people working. And, and one of the things uh, I'll mention on this is that uh, Linus Torvalds, uh, in his interview at uh, ELC Europe, talked about how he thought fuzzing was doing a really good job of fleshing out, um, uh, not fleshing out, flushing out. <laughs> Fleshing out bugs out of the Linux kernel. So he actually uh, likes this effort a lot. Okay, now on to tool chains. So the only, in terms of tool chains, uh, LLVM 4.0 has been released and you can't actually compile the kernel with LLVM. It takes a little bit of work, uh, but uh, you can do it. There was a session uh, on plumbers at that, about that. Well, both, uh, both at ELC 2017, uh, and uh, plumbers, uh, I'm building, well, the one at ELC, this, this one was about building a whole distro with uh, LLVM. This was about building the kernel with LLVM. So it is possible to use an alternate compiler on the kernel. And then finally, uh, I think finally, yeah, tracing. Uh, tracing continues to get better. Uh, the two things that have been added recently are the histogram uh, to be able to do analysis of scheduling events and then a, a sub-tool of perf called C2C, which does cache line contention analysis. So, um, and then a lot of this stuff, uh, they're working on making sure that all of this gets, uh, a lot of this shows up first in x86, and uh, then uh, people are working to provide the same types of features on uh, ARM or ARC64. Um, okay, so that was, a, that was a lot of territory, uh, just kernel issues. Um, some of these other ones are also kernel issues, but they kind of defy categorization, so they're on their own list. Um, so there's print K issues, your 2038 work, uh, Linux issues with Kconfig, and I'll just I'll just go through each of these. Um, so over the summer, there was a whole big discussion about print K. Um, a lot of there is a lot of problems with it. It's kind of complicated. It has uh, it's not per CPU. Uh, the console lock gets held, and and uh, so there's a big long discussion about it, but it's really hard to fix uh, because a lot of there's a lot of requirements on it. Um, <clears throat> uh, they don't they they cannot break print K because it's used by a lot of uh, a lot of tools use it, um, and it's used by the entire community for debugging and stuff. And uh, so uh, there have been people working on it, but uh, I haven't seen a whole lot of progress yet, a lot of discussion, but I uh, haven't seen any patches yet. Uh, there's also something having to do with uh, kernel continue. Uh, it, kernel continue is a flag, or it's hard to describe, it's a set of bytes you can put at the beginning of your uh, print K that says, well, this goes on the same line as the last message, but obviously there's race conditions that you can have where the lines get split, and uh, they're talking about uh, getting rid of it. Um, and use using some other output mechanism like uh, maybe seek buff uh, to output serialized data well, that's supposed to be data uh, atomically um, so it's a it's a weird little uh, detail but uh, the people are still working on uh, something as basic as print king um, 20 year 2017 work see I had the same problem last time this is supposed to be year 2038 work <laughs> so 
ignore that like that. Okay. So uh, we are concerned, although it's uh, how many years? 21 years away. People are concerned about what's going to happen with Linux in the year 2038 uh, when the 32-bit time counters roll over. Uh, and so, you know, we want to convert all the timestamps to 64-bit. That should solve us until like the end of the universe or something like that. Uh, but it takes a lot of work, and we need to do it now because there are systems. Uh, if you listen to people on the CIP project, there are systems that are being put in place now that will still be here in 20 years. <laughs> Uh, and so we need to actually have these things fixed uh, before they're in the field and cause problems. So there's the new static system call. Uh, there's a lot of patches that are in progress. Uh, the VSS layer, video for Linux, device mapper, input subsystem. Uh, but that's the, just the kernel side. You have to fix stuff up in the kernel. You also have to fix the C libraries, and you have to fix the apps. Uh, so there's three levels of work that has to go on, and people are working on all of this, but uh, not super fast. Um, uh, but the, like I said, the clock is kind of ticking, no pun intended. <laughs> um, there was a big discussion about kconfig. Uh, kconfig is kind of too hard for users. Uh, I think this is true, you know, he, it, there was a discussion on the kernel summit list about how kconfig is really difficult for desktop users. But I think the same thing is true for embedded users. You have a new project, you have no idea what config options you need to turn on for your hardware. It'd be nice if there were something automatic that could probe the hardware or you had some indication. Right now, people just, I know what I do when I'm working with a board is I use the one I got from the vendor and I don't modify it, right? It takes too much effort to go kind of go in and learn all the ins and outs if you want to try and optimize this stuff. Uh, so there's some, been some ideas to try and make this uh, a little bit more tractable, uh, more understandable. One is uh, to do config fragments. Uh, kind of higher level options um, and to do better dependencies so that if you modify something it's not gonna it's not gonna break your stack um, but this was a big discussion but I didn't see much ac actual work come out of it um, in device tree, there's a tool to help you oh yes okay yeah so there you go there's in device tree there's a tool to help you find uh, what configs are not getting right, what, what uh, device tree options don't get bound, right? Or, and you can map those back to, back to config options and vice versa. Yeah, anyway. Um, so AGL, uh, this is automotive, automotive grade Linux. Uh, we have the very first car, at least in the US, under, is a two, 2018 Toyota Camry. It's already, been, it's already on the roads in the US. Uh, this was announced at Open Source Summit Japan, and Mazda and Toyota are collaborating on, uh, on a uh, uh, car infotainment system called Entune. So actually some really good open source stuff is going on in the automotive industry. Um, Android, uh, the Android mainline status uh, is still pretty bad, but it's improving. That's, the, that's the, what I've been told. So there's lots of Android uh, SoC support that's still out of tree. Uh, vendors are starting to mainline things in particular. Uh, I heard that Qualcomm is investing more effort here. Um, but it will take time. It will take many years uh, before we see a lot of that uh, millions of lines of SOC code out of tree uh, before that's all mainline. Uh, one of the issues that came up is that Android kernels um, that are in shipping devices are usually about two years behind. Currently, uh, most phones are shipping uh, kernel version 4.4, which is about two years old. And that's just, that's unlikely to change just the nature of the market cycle and the development cycle of mobile phones and how many players there are in the supply chain and all that stuff. That's not gonna change. Uh, the issue is that LTS support uh, expires in two, at two years. So right as soon as the phone gets released, LTS goes away for it, uh, which is a problem. And so Greg has said, uh, LTS stands for Long Term Supported Kernel. So Greg has said he's going, he's willing to maintain a kernel for six years, uh, but only if people play nice and they actually use it. He's not going to put a whole bunch of effort into it if nobody ends up using it. Um, so uh, we'll see how that goes. That was just announced, uh, I don't know how many months ago, a couple months ago, I think. Uh, so one of, if you go out to kernel.org and look, one of those kernels is actually going to be, I think it's the 4.4, it will get maintained for at least six years. Um, also, 
this is a little bit related to Android, but it's kind of separate. Um, there is interest by Google in improving LTP. Uh, LTP has been kind of notorious as it's, it's got kind of a bad reputation. A lot of kernel developers don't like it and won't, don't run it. And um, so there are some projects out there, particularly between Google and Arrow, to, uh, to improve LTP, which is good for the whole industry. Um, and then you can read more about uh, this at uh, article on LWBM.net. Uh, Linux and supercomputers. This has absolutely nothing to do with embedded, but I threw it in because it was kind of cool. Linux now runs in 100% of the top 500 supercomputers. Okay, as of November. Okay, it's 100%. It's 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 past world domination. It's it's uh, they, they have assimilated every supercomputer on the planet. Well, in the top 500, uh, it was it was 99.6% in June. And they got like the last two, I guess the two that were running non-Linux have dropped out. So uh, the most powerful machine in the world uh, is uh, something it's called is China's Sunway Taihu Light, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It uses 650,000 processors, which seems excessive, but I guess this is a supercomputer. Um, anyway, so that's kind of cool. Linux is completely dominating that space. Um, and it's actually pretty dominating pretty much in embedded as well. I mean, uh, in terms of phones and uh, co consumer electronics devices and all kinds of embedded things. Uh, this, this is the slide I added uh, now about 45 minutes ago. Um, the, so Free RTOS has had a license change. <laughs> so I see, I see wait a <laughs> uh, So it, it used to be GPL2 with some weird extra clauses. Uh, and now it's not. So the guy, the primary developer of this, named Richard Berry, started working for Facebook last year. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize this, but this is apparently. Is it the, Amazon? Oh, Amazon. It's yes. Amazon. You're right. I have. This is wrong. Okay. Don't download these slides yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's Amazon. I don't know why. How did I get Facebook? In? Oh well. Anyway. Okay. So, uh, but they just released Free RTOS version 10 with an MIT license. But. They couldn't resist the urge to modify the MIT license. So they removed the GPLv2, which had the weird extra clauses, and then they added an extra weird clause to MIT. And so, um, but this is a pretty big deal. Free RTOS, if you look at most, um, most surveys of embedded operating system deployments, uh, Free RTOS is like really high. Um, and so I'm not. It'll be interesting. I, I just saw this. I haven't had time to like uh, process it in my brain, but you know some of the other ones like NutX and Zephyr. Uh, maybe sh I don't know how, how this will impact them, but there's bound to be an impact anyway. So that's that's interesting. Has nothing to do with uh, embedded Linux, but but it does embed it. So um, okay. Now going a slightly different direction, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CE workgroup projects. Uh, we have kind of four main things that we're working on in the CE Workgroup and the Linux Foundation, uh, and I'll talk about those. So we have a shared embedded distribution. Uh, there's an effort to try and get companies to collaborate on, uh, on an industry-supported distribution of embedded Linux. Uh, the main goal for this is very long-term support, uh, and uh, the main work seems to be clustered around uh, adding support to the Octo project or to Debian or both to uh, to work together, uh, and there are three projects that, uh, and we're actually there's a presentation at the end of the day, right? Someone's given a presentation on on this. The uh, MetaDebian, ISAR, and Elbe uh, are have been in talks with each other and are communicating about sharing their recipes. So each of these is projects that builds builds uh, an embedded distribution based on Debian, but using a set of Yocto project recipes. Okay, that sounds kind of complicated, but it's the promise of this is that you'll get all of the long-term maintenance for free from Debian, at least at the packed level, and then you just need to work out the build issues and stuff. Uh, so it's actually pretty pretty cool. Um, it would be nice to have uh, a smaller number of embedded distros. Uh, Yocto Project and Open Embedded and Buildroot, they kind of have a tendency because everybody can just mix and match wildly to fragment the, the distro. Um, layer uh, in embedded. <clears throat> so it would be nice to unfragment that. You could share more support costs. Uh, the long-term support initiative. Uh, so LTSI is kind of an industry version 
uh, of LTS. Uh, the 4.9 release of this is currently out. We just had uh, we just had uh, the merge window for 4.14 for this, I believe. Um, so most of the industry is actually on. Most of the embedded industry is either using LTS or LTSI, uh, and those are they're pretty close to each other. Uh, and that's been a big change. Um, so LTSI has an upstream first policy for patches. It didn't used to, but it does now. Uh, security fixes are very important, so it's uh, it's important. Um, so something like LTSI, where vendors can share the costs of uh, of managing these security fixes, is is really useful. And there's a talk you can look at there. Uh, test framework. I'm going to talk all about this later in the day, so I'm going to skip it now. In fact, look, you can go out and get that resource. <laughs> Actually, you can't yet. It's not uploaded, but <laughs> but it will be. Uh, so um, I'll talk about Fuego later. And then the eLinux wiki, uh, it has, uh, it's a site where you can put, if, if you need to kind of corral a project uh, <coughs> and you need wiki space, go out and use the eLinux wiki, that's what it's there for. If you need to collaborate with other people and use a place to put files and uh, documents and information, uh, that's, it's available for that. One of the things, biggest things that it has, I think, that's a real value to the industry is it has the slides and videos for 12 years of Embedded Linux Conference. And a lot of the videos are still valuable today. Even these videos from 12 years ago, uh, there was a kernel, I looked uh, back before Embedded Linux Conference Europe, and there's a, a panel of kernel developers with Greg Crow Hartman on it, and he's saying the same thing 12 years ago that he says today in terms of what you need to do to be a good you know, contributor, how to get patches mainline. Uh, so the information, some of the information is dated, but a lot of it is still really valuable. Um, so please use that to that site. And uh, then just a couple of final notes on other things. Trade, in terms of trade associations, uh, Lenaro is really doing a lot of great work. Um, and they've, uh, they're, they've jumped on the Zephyr bandwagon, uh, which is really good. Lenaro Connect, as a conference, has a lot of really consistently useful material, and they do. Uh, they also do videos of their conference. I think ELC and Lenaro Connect are real are like the only two ones that I know of. Maybe Kernel Recipes that produce videos of like all the sessions. So that means you don't have to go to them. You can still get all this value from them, uh, which is really great. Um, and then the Linux Foundation continues to grow. Uh, they had their first event in China this year. Sold out in two weeks with 1,200 attendees. So that's a pretty good start in China. Uh, they have they're running over a hundred conferences a year, which is absolutely amazing. That's that's on average more about two per week. <laughs> that's unbelievably uh, difficult. Uh, and then they have 67 projects, not just Linux. They're doing blockchain and all these other types of open source projects. Uh, so very strong trade associations. Uh, this is a list of the conferences for ELC and ELC Europe. You can go out and see all the presentations. Well, not all of them. If you see a presentation, some, some of the presentations don't have the slides listed. If you, if you want to see something that's not there, if you know the original author, ping them. But if you don't know them, send me an email and I will go off and do it. I try to, a couple of times I do try to do a sweep where I contact the authors and try to get their slides. Everybody's supposed to have their slides at the time of the event, but some people dawdle and they don't get them up. I just saw, uh, there was like two or three slides I wanted to look at while I was making this that were not there. I gotta go contact people. But in general, all of the slides and videos are supposed to be up here. So you can go look at these presentations. Again, very valuable information. You don't have to have paid a lot of money to go to, the, go to these to get the information. In terms of ones coming up, uh, we have Embedded Linux Conference 2018 in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we have Japan Jamborees already scheduled for next year. Um, and then the Open Source Summit in Japan is coming up June 20th and 22nd. And ELC Europe will be in Scotland uh, in October again. So lots of opportunities to meet with us and uh, figure out what you want to do. So please submit the CFP. What? 2018, you're going to do a repeat. Oh, yeah, <laughs> this is what happens when you do the slides at 4 in the morning. Uh, okay, then uh, again, kind of a random thing, uh, legal issues. A big thing happened on the kernel mailing list right at the end of the 4.14 release cycle. In fact, it was in 4.14 RC7, a big patch went in. And usually that doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> so, so there was some consternation about that on the mailing list. 
Uh, but uh, basically what the patch did was it took a whole bunch of files, I think it was 12,000 files, that had no license information on them, uh, in them, and tagged them with SPDX license IDs. Uh, and so there were people who complained about that, saying, well, what if I didn't really want it to be a license? And most, most of the lawyers agree that if, uh, if there's a, a file sitting in the kernel tree and it does not specify what license, uh, then, it, then it falls under the copying file, right? Whatever the license for the whole project is. So they felt, after com talking to a lot of lawyers, a ton of work went into this patch, uh, but there were some, still some complaints about the process that was used for this patch. But if you go and look now in the kernel source tree, in fact, go to the top level make file, you'll see the very top line is an SPA, SPDX identifier. Uh, so if you want to see what it looks like. That's actually really handy if you want to track uh, the license status of stuff in the kernel. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, and we'll see more of that. We'll see licenses clarified. So I think they did a study and they found that, uh, well, I think it was 450K worth of comments was uh, licensed text. And there were small variations all over the place. <laughs> and so, it, so there were, there were uh, I don't remember the actual count, but it was a lot of different variations of the GPL v2 license. Uh, so I said, well, let's, let's so they did a classic uh, computer science abstraction where they said, well, we'll just have a token that means this license. And now it, it collapses the uh, differences and, is, uh, and reduces all these comments that are just wasted space. Um, and it provides extra legal clarity. Uh, OK, so this is where I get my information for this talk from lwn.net. If uh, they have great resources out there, if you go to the kernel page in particular, uh, they have, there's a kernel <coughs> index where you can see on it pretty, just about any topic in the kernel, USB or memory management or file systems, you can find you know, lots of articles. Um, also the same thing with events. If you're interested in a particular event, uh, they have a whole event categorized page where they say which articles they wrote for talks for that event. And they don't cover every talk, obviously, but they, uh, but if you, but uh, they do have some, and it's it's handy to you know if you remember a talk or something that you saw, you might check for an article. Kernel Newbase has a really good page uh, that talks about uh, what the features that are in all the different kernel versions, and then elinux.org, especially the events uh, page on that has uh, slides and videos, and then the CLX dev mailing list. So how did I do on time? Oh, I'm way early. Uh, so anyway, that's it. <laughs> Uh, any questions on any of the stuff? I have, yeah. I have a few, but okay. I'll, I'll just go through them randomly. So what, maybe it's more of a question for Frank, but it's the device <laughs> tree. Um, there was a patch about YAML support. Yes. Is that ever coming back? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, um, Frank yeah. says no. <laughs> um, uh, Pentelis has a prototype compiler to take YAML source for device tree instead of our traditional source format. Yeah. Um, he has lots of reasons for that. At the moment, it's experimental, and he's continuing to work on that. Um, I don't expect to accept that into the Linux kernel. It, it may exist outside. If you want to talk about that later, it's, it's yeah, an interesting yeah, discussion. It's an interesting discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Frank's just a mean maintainer, isn't yeah. he? <laughs> Actually, that so Pantelis, but Pantelis and Grant and I had a kind of a reference to that on one of my slides. Grant, uh, Grant Lackley and Pantelis did get together and talk about some of this stuff at the Device Tree session workshop, work, workshop at, the summit. <laughs> at the Kernel Summit. So there may be some other thing similar to that because there are a lot of people interested in validation. Yeah. And so and that session is documented on elinux.org, followed the Device Tree section. So the notes and the slides are there. Oh, okay. Cool. Good use of elinux.org. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. I have a few more, but I'll just ask the easy one. So the, the license, SPDX, <laughs> is it the plan to get rid of all of the text? Because they just updated it on the, the cases where the file didn't have SPDX. But in right. the long run, are we going to get rid of it? And all I think in the long run, what they want to do is they want to get rid of Yeah. I mean. It's in the kernel source tree, right? So it's supposed to be GPL v2 yeah. plus the one or two little extra comments that Linus made. 
Um, and it's supposed to be L GPLv2 only, right? You took out the clause or later. Um, and so I, I, there, lawyers who are looking at this stuff are um, anxious about a, any ambiguity in the licensing terms. And so I think what they'd like to do is they, they would like to go through, and actually I think the very first set of patches to non- to, to files that already had a license has already gone into 4.15. Um, so I think they are going to actually start pulling out the, the big block of code, or not code, the comment at the top of files and, and start replacing it. I think that's the overall goal, but uh, we'll have to see what the maintainers... I think most maintainers are on board. I think they just got caught a little off guard with uh, this first patch that went in. Um, so. And the C++ element. Oh, yeah, yeah, and the, and, and the fact that they used a C++ comment to do it, right? They're using a slash slash. And Lena said he's now okay with C++ comments, or he kind of said it. I, it's like, you know, anyway. So, some people really didn't like the C++ comment thing either. So, any, anything else? Or? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Okay, we can talk about it. Any, any other questions about anything I've talked about? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I was very uh, interested in uh, uh, size reduction. You, oh, okay. you, you say uh, one megabyte Linux running. Yeah. Is it feasible? Feasible. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, so yeah, yeah. Ta -ta -ta it's, it's, one, one it's been done. Yeah. Right? So peop you can't actually do it. Mm. Uh, and in fact, Nicholas. Nicholas Petrie, mm -hmm. uh, his goal mm -hmm. is to run mm -hmm. the Linux kernel mm -hmm. in 256k. Mm -hmm. Oh, but <laughs> but he's he's doing XIP mm -hmm. in Norflash, so mm -hmm. and so most of the actual kernel text mm -hmm. is outside of RAM, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so um, so I'm not well. I don't know. I. I'd have to look around the industry, but my impression is not a lot of systems have that much NORFLASH. A lot of people have SPI NORFLASH, which you can't use for XIP. Uh, but, uh, well, I don't know. Can you? You can, yeah. Can you? Oh, well, that's interesting. Okay. They do some sort of version of the access to do some memory maps. They do it on, on the fly? Do they map? Can you map the whole thing in at once? or? Some sort of window, like 64. Okay. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. So okay. So um, yeah, but I would really like to see Nicholas succeed, mm -hmm. even with that SP, even with the XIP, you know, and the really low <coughs> memory footprint, because that he's what he did was he switched over because he was in that situation. He switched over from trying to optimize the text, the the, or the code segment, to the data segment. And so he's been doing, lately he's been doing a lot of data segment reductions. Uh, trying to, in fact, he went, when, one of the things he did was went into device tree and hacked it up. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's he did, but he sli sliced it down, I guess. Yeah. So, and he, he's... It's actually in, uh, Rob accepted it. Oh, okay. The so there's actually, if, does that require a config option? that you're not doing dynamic device tree. Okay. But otherwise it's just standard stuff. Is so. it a knit stuff that goes away or is it uh, um, it trims Well that's okay. We can talk off that. Yeah. <laughs> so but anyway that's that's actually pretty cool. And he's still working on it is it trims out nodes that are not actually used when you um, instantiate the device tree in, in memory. Oh, it okay. just locks those off. Okay. Is, is it available to access the, such a uh, documentation or a slide or something? Um, yes. If yes. you, um, the best thing for that stuff is to go to under S for system size. Oh yeah, this this one right here. Uh, it's is that is a video. So if you look at that video, he talks about this stuff. I see. So that's from Lenaro Connect. That was just in September. So. 
I see, I see. Thank you. Yeah. He also put a text first down on the mail list. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, Michael refers to that. So Michael has a long list of these stuff with a lot of pointers to references as well. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.